Last Sunday, we went through Ephesians chapter 4, and we learned about the purpose of the church and the role of the gifts of leadership that Jesus gave to the church. And we emphasized uh, verse 12, that uh, these gifts that Jesus ga gave to the church, the leaders, are for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying or building up of the body of Christ. So we also emphasize the word perfecting because it's so meaningful. So on the uh, slide number two, we have a, a, a summary of what we have talked about last week. Because I prefer, as I said last week, I prefer the word perfecting to the word equipping. Because the word equipping is more task oriented. The word perfecting is more like building our lives. How can we be uh, sent to do the task of the Lord if we have not yet perfected yes uh, first? So here it talks about uh, to mending or to repair what was broken or damaged. That includes the mess of our past. What we've done in our life that uh, messed up our lives, our twisted world view from our traditions, customs, and our sinful life, our brokenness from our guilt and shame that hinders us to fully believe that God wants to use us. And because of these things, we have not yet been repaired, so we cannot enter fully in the work that God has for us. And the second definition is to uh, make fit, to adjust, to put in order, to rearrange, which is our discipleship, our growing in the Lord. And the third one is the, the strengthening or the perfecting. When we say to perfect, it's not this describing the state of perfection, of course not, but the process of being perfected. So that's what we, is. we think about this as a potter with the clay. He makes, he takes uh, unshaped, uh, some clay and then he, he makes it into a nice shape when he is satisfied you have a vase but still not finished he needs to bake it he needs to put some varnish he needs to put some decorations on it and makes it beautiful like he intend to do so that is the perfecting he takes the, 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 the clay on form clay and make it gradually into something that would be useful to the master's use. So that's what we're talking about. So today we want to go a little bit uh, further and talk about how we walk with the Lord. Remember the verse that we started last week? I urge you or I beseech you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you have received from the Lord. Or walk in a manner worthy or that measures up to the calling that for which you have been called. So are we measuring up? Are we walking in a manner that is worthy of that calling. In slide number three, we will see that in Ephesians, throughout the book of Ephesians, there are seven times using uh, this walk, this verb walk, or the significance of that. 2 1, chapter 2, verse 1. You once walked in sins. 2 10. Walk doing the good things that God prepared. Chapter 4, verse 1. Walk worthy of your calling. Chapter 4 verse 17, walk no longer as the Gentiles do. Chapter 5 verse 2, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us. 5 8, walk as children of light. And 5 15, walk circumspectly. So hopefully we will get to all of them, but we will begin this morning and go as far as we can and then we are going back to chapter 2 of Ephesians. Okay, before we go to this, I want to ask your help. If I want to describe something very wonderful, but I want to have words other than wonderful, better than wonderful, more extraordinary than wonderful, give me some words that I could use. I'm, I'm just a, a French speaker, so I'm not really good in, in uh, all of these mm, fancy words. So give me some fancy words that are, you know, superlative form of wonderful. Awesome. awesome. Yeah, awesome. And then? Excellent, Excellent. yes. Amazing. Amazing. Perfect. Perfect. Wow, that's, that's a great work. Wow. Admirable. Wow, that's, that's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, continue. I'm getting excited now. Any more? Magnificent. Magnificent. Yes. 
You are so good. Thank you so much for your participation. I'm doing this little exercise with you in order to get you ready for chapter two of Ephesians. Because all of these words, and we could continue to make superlative words, expressions, to describe that chapter. This is the core message of the gospel that you have there. You know, there are not many texts in the Bible that can summarize the full gospel. You can think of John chapter 3, verse 16, which is in one verse, you have all the elements of the gospel summarized in one verse. God, because God so loved the world, He gave His only Son, so that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, go to hell, but will go to heaven with Him, will, will have eternal life. So in this verse, you have everything. But the other place that is the richest and description of the gospel message, will, you will find it in uh, the, uh, this chapter, uh, Ephesians chapter 2. This is, this is where. So that's why I wanted you to, to, to tell me some big words about this. Because you know what? When you, you, you look at Ephesians chapter 2, you, how many times have you read this chapter? You are so familiar with this. And as we know, familiarity breeds contempt. It's just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We have read it so many times. So here we go. Pastor is going to preach again on this uh, chapter. So that's why I wanted to prepare your mind to not to go in that m sleeping mode but to get your mind excited for the wonderful, admirable, magnificent, perfect, and extraordinary text that we are going to look at today. Amen. Yeah. Hey, now I got your attention. Okay, <laughs> go to the next, next uh, verse and we will start with that. Okay, and I have used also to help you, to give you a fresh uh, meaning, I'm using the... ERV, easy to read version, instead of the most familiar NIV or New King James. In the past, you were spiritually dead because of your sins and the things you did against God, sins or trespasses. Yes, in the past, your lives were full of those sins. You walked the way the world lives, following the ruler of the evil power, the Spirit now working in those who refuse to obey God. In the past, all of us lived like that, trying to please our sinful selves. We did all the things our bodies and mind wanted. Like everyone else in the world, we deserved to suffer God's anger just because of the way we were, or by nature we are children of wrath. But God is rich in mercy, and He loved us, very much. So we are beginning there. In Ephesians chapter 2, when the chapter begins, you see the state we were in. Spiritually dead. Wow, that's not really good. But when the chapter finish, we are a dwelling place where God lives by His Spirit. Wow, what happened between verse 1 and the last verse of the chapter? This incredible transformation and change. So in between, the beginning and the end, you have the descriptions of how, why, what happened to that transformation that we go from being dead in sin, being uh, deserving judgment and the wrath of God, and to being seated high with Christ and being a dwelling place of God and the Spirit. So what happened in the, in the middle? So we need to talk about that. Yes, in the past. Verse 1 and verse 2, Paul is talking to the Gentiles because it is the continuation of chapter 1. He's talking to the Gentiles. You live like that. You were living in all these kind of sins. But if you observe in verse 3, you will see that he changed from you to we. Jewish people are also included. We, like you, are full of sin. And f we, like you Gentiles, are deserving of, the, of God's wrath. So this is something you need to, to know of. We, you and I, we are included in this, follow the sin of our generations. We walk the way the world lives. The people, the neighbors, or cultures, or parents, or traditions, of whatever sins there is, fashion, trends, we just follow the, the models of our generation, the things that we have learned. This is, we conform ourselves 
to the mold of this world. Unfortunately, this is sad, but this is true. This is how, uh, un until the power of God break this control, uh, with this following of, then this is, this is how we are living. We followed the, pr the prince of the power of the air. And so he is the spirit, and, and be careful about what you read. He is the spirit that is now, now, I repeat it, now working. So that's the spirit since Genesis chapter 3 from the fall of man. He has become the expert. The, the spirit who is working, who has been working, who is working, will continue to work to lead people away from God. To make them think of God in another way than God wants you to know Him. To lead you astray and to call you to, to do the things that you want to do. To live for yourself. To live to satisfy the body's and the mind's uh, desires. To live to please our sinful selves. And isn't it true that everything, all the goals, think, think a little bit. What are most of people's goals in life? What are they aiming? What are the aspirations that people have? Isn't it to satisfy self? Yes. Bigger this, bigger that, more of this, more of that. How much is enough? How can we be pleased? How many people choose as a goal of life, as our supreme aspiration, to serve in the ghetto? somewhere and to go and live in the slum and to live sacrificially how many of us has this big dream this is my calling this is what i'm doing not so many of us so that that is what we we we, we find here in nature we follow we follow and this is we live like that this is how the devil uh, succeeded to bring the whole world to lay under his power and his influence and things like that. And you know, the power of the, we see, see the prince of the power of the air, see, this, a spirit. We are talking about a spiritual entity, someone that we do not see but exists. You get it? He is there, but we don't see it. So because we don't see it, it's easy to ignore. It's easy to be unaware. It's easy to not think much of him. But everything that went bad or could go bad, all the potential from, for evil that exists in this world, that ever existed in your own life, is from him. So he is at work. He has been at work. And he is now working. So we need to watch over it. Because he is our enemy. And Paul is so clearly marking, this is a very strong statement. Think about it. This is the beginning of the message of the gospel, the bad news. But it is the reality also. It's the reality check. This is the world. This is you. This is me. This is us without Christ. Or this is us under the influence of the spirit that is now at work. This is a very dangerous place. This is the reality. And because of that, we are going to, to end under the, the, uh, the, what we deserve is the wrath of God, the judgment of God. That's what this chapter here, these verses are all about. We don't see the spirit. He is working. A dark supernatural force at work in us. At work in us, in each generation, at work in our parents' generation, Work in our generation, work in our children's generation, and in our grandchildren's generation. He is there. He's been there. And he is a specialist in what he does. He is very good at being the devil. He knows how to do that. He is a good devil, if we can put it. Not good in the sense of uh, morally good. He's good at what he does. He knows how to be uh, the devil completely. To mi mis mislead people and to tempt people to, to please our sinful self. Amen? And then it says that he leads us to do everything that our body and, and minds is searching for. Or is uh, um, greedy for. Lusting after or wants. And the word minds here is the deep minds. Uh, it's a word that is used in the New Testament that is also including imagination. 
Now let's talk about our imagination for a moment. Do you have an imagination? How is your imagination going? Is that pretty good, pretty fertile? Is that like going in every direction? You don't know. You know, the, the, the trick with our imagination is that we don't, we, not many people know. <laughs> you see, when Jesus said, for example, do not commit adultery. Adultery is easy to, to, to identify. Actually, people identify a lady that was caught in adultery. So that is a, a material, it is an a, a act that is visible or that, that is present in our society. But Jesus says, be careful because when you and your imagination give or yield to lust, your imagination is thinking, nobody sees that. The act of adultery, if you have an affair, you will get caught. And this is good for us to know also. That if you ever consider, be careful, you will get caught. Everybody get caught, you know? You, you, you think you are very good in hiding, you can go to another city, you can go to <laughs> hide in a restaurant, in a hotel, go wherever you are, you want, you will get caught. Somebody will see you. You know, it's, it's amazing this world uh, today. The, we, we see the world is small. It is true, the world is small. So don't try that. Don't try that. <laughs> Stay with Jesus. But in, in the imagination, you, you know, people don't know what you are imagining. But you know. And God knows. So here says the devil here is tempting us to walk, to please our sinful selves, doing everything that our body craves for and our, what our imagination also is aiming at. So be careful. Imagination is hidden in our secret life. But God knows. So be careful what you do with your imagination. Then the, this text says also, we were dead. And it's really dead. It's not really a, a, a symbolism. It's really spiritually dead. Think of it this way. Sin, because that's what we're talking about. Sin is like a deadly poison. You, either you drank your deadly poison or you've been inoculated with deadly poison. So you have a poison running through your veins and it's gradually killing you there's no cure for that there's no antidote for sure you're going to die the poison is making you gradually worse and worse and you're going to die that is the death that we have we have the this sinful nature is bringing us to toward death you carry the virus of death and judgment it is given to all men to die once, and then comes judgment. Judgment is inevitable. Even think about the, the sinful man that lives without Christ. Okay, let's say he has hope. He hopes for a better future. He has goal to have success in this way that he has some high and supposedly, uh, in the society, noble aspiration. Even these are deceiving him. Because at the end, it leads everyone without Christ to eternal darkness. So even the, 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 the good thoughts, even the good plans, even the success, even the aspiration is deceiving, is deceitful. Because we are going to go to eternal death without Christ. So that's when he says, we are dead we are dead. That's what Paul means. We are dead in, in sin. And this is, this is the state in which we, we walk before Christ. This week, Bridget and I, we, we met a, a friend, somebody that uh, we, we want to uh, know more. And uh, we were having a conversation and uh, we, we used a good Samaritan Everybody knows about the Good Samaritan. Even non-Christian knows about the Good Samaritan, isn't it? Because it's used as an illustration of social illustration, the Good Samaritan. Then she, she, we, we, we took for granted, and, and you know the story. And she says, no, what's that? I never, I never heard. And we were very sad. How can it possible that in today's generation, nobody has heard about such a familiar story as a Good Samaritan? Even non-believers use and quote the Good Samaritan. So the state in which we walk before Christ is described as we are full of sins. And at the end, we are deserving of something. Uh, 
I did not include it in the sermon, but just after you finish uh, verse 10, going to verse 11, 12, and 19, uh, the 12, 13, and 19, it says, remember at one time. Again, it comes back to this old picture of before and after. Because this text here, it's the most, chapter 2 of Ephesians, it's the most detailed picture of our conversions. There's no other text that goes into so much details about the before and the after. You can see both sides of your life. You look before, you remember, and you look after what Christ has done and the intentions of God. There's no other text that gives such a, a beautiful, detailed picture of a conversion. Remember, at one time, you were without the Messiah, excluded from citizenship without covenant of promise, without hope in the world, and without God. You remember, you were like that. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of this text, I'm thinking of uh, people who are refugees, asylum seekers, without citizenship, without hope in the world, like you don't belong here, you don't belong there, you have no place to go. And then verse 13 starts differently, but now, you have been brought near, like the Gentiles, you have been brought near to Christ. In verse 19, you are no longer strangers or aliens, but you are fellow citizens. You belong now, you are citizens. You have a passport, you have a green card, you have something, you have an identity. And you have become members of God's family. Again, a similar illustration is given to us in the before and in the after with what Christ has done. Amen? Paul writes this text with great passion. Well, you, you, you need to think about this with a great passion because twice Paul used the expression, you have been saved. By grace you have been saved. Go to the next uh, slide. You will read with me. In verse 5 and verse 8, twice Paul with passion, we've done this very strong statement. By grace you have been saved. While we were spiritually dead because of our sins, but God made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. Verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not our own doing, this is the gift of God and not the result of our good actions to put a stop to all those things. Here we recognize the doctrines of Paul, the, 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 the doctrines we find it in Galatians and Romans, how he insists about salvation by faith. Verse 5, he reassures us again that the, the deliverance from the horrible state that he described at the beginning of the chapter, we have been rescued while we were in that state. But God made us alive. God has come to our rescue. By grace, you have been helped. You have been rescued. You have been pulled out of that. By grace, God came to you when you were yet in that state. And that's wonderful. We will come back to that. We should get really excited because at first, remember, we talked about a dark spiritual force that is now at work, that has been working in our lives in the past. So there is here a greater spiritual force that has come. And this is a resurrection power because a resurrection took place. We were dead. He made us alive. Think about this. This is wonderful. And nowhere else than this, this chapter you will find such a rich descriptions of God's grace. Okay, look at that. Verse 3, by our very nature we were subject to God's anger just like everyone else. That's how it first. But if you look at the, at the click here, you will see this, this, this verse here. L look at uh, this series of verse that I brought together to make the, the a richer uh, coming together of the message. Verse 7, verse 8, and verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, has shown the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness toward us. It is the gift of God. Look at all the words in bold. Mercy, love, kindness, grace, and gift. What a collection of meaningful words. But that's not enough. Paul doesn't use uh, grace and kindness enough. He used 
superlative words to go with that because this is he's too much passionate and he wants you to not only read it just like that he wants you to stop and think about the grace of God and the, the, the character, the generosity of God's nature and his love. How big, how deep, how strong, how extraordinary and extravagant it is. You know, I was asking you at the beginning to give me some superlative of the word wonderful. But here you will have a list of superlative. What are the, the superlative expression that God used? It's to express the highest degree of everything. He's searching for word. Okay. Someone, for example, says um, uh, amazing. But today, amazing is really, we, we, uh, we, we hear it too much. Is that right? Amazing is not amazing anymore. It's not really, really super amazing. Like, uh, because uh, we use it for everything. Oh, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. It is, we have lost the excitement of the, of, of the, of the word uh, amazing. So what other words can describe the highest degree of quality like to make us say wow to the character of God in this one? Look at some of these, of these words that, that we, we have in, in this text here. Wow, so wonderful. Super let's see. Uh, Outstanding, immeasurable, I'm, I'm taking it from different Bible version. Immeasurable, incredible wealth of grace, uh, exceeding, surpassing. So you have this rich, when God, when Paul talks about the grace of God, he doesn't say, oh, the grace of God is good, it's amazing. He just put it like, a, he's looking for a word. It's like, it's like a, a man that is madly in love and he wants to say a poem to his girlfriend. He, he does, he's lost in words and he doesn't have enough words to say everything that he wants to say in his, in his, in his heart. You know, uh, poetry and, and love and romance sometimes make you say so, so, all sorts of exaggeration. I, I, te I tell my wife that uh, when I seem to, she, she tells me sometimes I exaggerate. And I said, no, I'm not exaggerating. And words, you can say anything. It's poetry. You're not exaggerating. You know? So the, the reason of God's intervention is very clear in this verse here. Because of the great love with which he loved us. That's the reason. Not that you look smart. Not that you are rich, not because you have potential, not because you come from a country or another. It's just not to do with you. So let's humble ourselves. It's not about how smart we are. It's just out of God's superlative love and extravagant. What is the greatness of his gift? How can we describe the greatness of his gift? Surpassing, immeasurable, exceeding riches of God's grace. That's what he's talking about. Look at the next slide. We will look also at a change here from being dead and, and sins, full of sin, having the nature that deserves judgment. We are changed in state and identity and in position. You, you read here because of the great love that he loved us with. Even when we were dead in our trespasses. Number one, he made us alive together with Christ. That's a change of identity and state. We were dead. He made us alive. Okay, resurrection. Then he raised us up with him. Oh, that's even better. And seated us with him in the heavenly place. What makes God's love so outstanding in this text? Why, why are we praising and using all these kind of great expressions? The, the exceeding greatness of God's love is contrasted with the extreme unworthiness and unloveliness of the person loved, which is me and you. Can you say this morning, I'm unworthy? I'm not a lovable person. I don't deserve it. But that's, that's true. We don't like to say that. It feels weird. Eh? You look yourself in the mirror in the morning and says, I am unworthy. <laughs> don't do that because you will become depressed if you do that. <laughs> okay, just to make an illustration this morning. But what makes the love of God outstanding, it's the object of his love. The extreme unworthiness and unloveliness of the person being loved. We were dead while we were dead in our trespasses. He loved us to that point. 
Uh, there's a man here, I will give you a quote, named George Williams. He said it in this way. Amazing thought that a Mary Magdalene and a crucified thief should be the companions and glory of the Son of God. I will repeat that. It's amazing, it's outstanding that Mary Magdalene, who was possessed with seven demons, that you can imagine what kind of life she lived by having that in her life, and the crucified men on the cross, that they would be the companions and glory of the Son of God. How amazing is it that you and I we would be the companions and glory of Jesus Christ, not deserving while we were dead in sin, while we were totally undeserving and unworthy of that. So we need to, to focus on that. And it is also about our new positions, our new identity and our new position in Christ. We are seated with him, and it's all with him and him. It's all because of Christ. Christ is the representative of all of that for us. He has given us, imagine, from having the nature of wrath, having deserved the judgment, the full anger of God, now He lifts us up to the position of honor, equal with His position. He brings us with Him, and He seats us with Him in the heavenlies. That is total change, I would say. A change of a, a privilege of trust, a, a privilege, the position of honor. Think of the prodigal son. The prodigal son rep is a very good illustration of what we're talking about. He, he broke fellowship. He took the money. He spent it in vices and sins. When he had nothing, when all his life was messed up, when he had no hope, nowhere to turn, when he was eating the food that he was given to the pigs and he was not even allowed to, then I will go back to my father. What happened when he goes back to the father? All these filthy rags. The filthy rags of the prodigal son represents the best that we have to offer to God. We are always so quick to boast to, go, to, to God. Look, God, I'm so good. Look, I have merits. I have done this. I have done that. So many good religious deeds or good actions. And it is like the filthy rags. That's what it says in, in Isaiah. So the prodigal son comes back to his father with his dirty, stained, you know, smelling like pig. I don't know if you have ever had this experience, but in, in Quebec, we, I come from an agricultural area. And we have these huge pig farms. I mean, it's not really a farm. It's like now you know it's, everything is industrial. So you have this, this huge building and you may have thousands of pigs there. <laughs> Imagine what it smells. <laughs> and uh, I'm not making it up. It's, it's like that, okay? And I had a, a, a friend of mine, his father was one of these big pig farmers. And uh, he had like a, a garage. And then when he would come from the, 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 the pig place, uh, he would take a shower first. There was a place at the building to take a shower. Then he would come to the garage and he would remove his clothes and put it there. Take another shower. Then he would come in the house and still you could smell the pig. I'm not making it up. It's, 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 it just does that, okay? So, okay, coming back to the, to the <laughs> father of the prodigal son. He's coming back and this is what he smells, this is what he looks like, and he comes to his father. What does the father do? First thing, removes the dirty clothes, give him a shower, clean him, give him the ring, the, the, the identity, my son, give him a, red, a good dress, good shoes, and a party. You know, like the, the celebration, my son was dead and he is alive. Shouldn't we celebrate and have a party? That's what we're talking about right here in this text. This change of position. This is how God sees you. Imagine, God sees you highly positioned, a place of honor, a place of pri privilege. I used to be um, living on Vancouver Island. It's lots of mountains in the British Columbia. And my favorite mountains called Mount Aerosmith. 
and sometimes just to uh, you know relax I would climb Mount Aerosmith and it's big enough that at some point there's no more trees it's only the, the, the rock and that's what I, I like so I would go on top and from the top of Mount Aerosmith you could see both sides of the, the oceans on both sides of the island and then you look at the town and then you see the, the, the town and you see the details you, you don't have the same perspective if you walk in town you, you, you see the street, you, you see the building from this, this height. When you are on the top of the mountain, you see it from the top. You see different things, like going on the, on the airplane or something. You look down, it's so different. God has given you and me a, a, high, a higher position in our life. What happens when you are sitting with Christ? You see things differently. You think differently. You know, we, we have this privilege of knowing so much about the road, the streets of this world, the plan of the citizenship of this world, the, the, the country of this world. And you see further because the Word of God gives you this guide book, the, the, the street guide if you want. And you see the end of the road, you see the Re book of Revelation, you see what's coming, you see tribulation coming, you see the end of the world coming, you see all of the events described in the Bible that are coming to pass. So you are sitting from a high position and you look at your life now, and even you have glimpse of the future because you are sitting high above with Christ. And this should affect your actions. It should affect your decisions making. It should affect your investment. It should affect the way that you, the things that you want to do for Christ because you, you have a higher position. You see the things from God's point of view. Amen? amen. Please say amen to that. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Next slide. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. That's the word we want to look at. Why has God dealt with sinners, unworthy sinners, in that way? How did he deal with us? Did he come to us and give us condition if you do this, if you don't do that? Uh, no. He didn't do anything. He just gift. He just dealt with us through a gift and we gave some superlative descriptions of this gift before. It's the basis of salvation. Why has God dealt with sinners by giving you a gift? It's described in that text so that no boasting. You cannot boast. You cannot, you know, Look at me, I, I've done that, my merit or something. God eliminate all possibilities of both. He give it to you free before you can even, you know, do anything or try to do something. Because our pride, human prides, this is even in sin, we still have this arrogance to show God our human pride. That's what we were talking about, our, our righteousness. We show our righteousness to God and God says, this is filthy rags to me. So the gift of salvation is by grace. It's a gift and we obtain it by faith as we know so much. And verse 10 will tell us the uh, results of the salvation. We start from there and now we enter into the result of that great salvation we read about. We are is workmanship. Workmanship, uh, I think you have heard it many times, but actually it comes from the word that means that which is made. God's making. The handicraft of God. It's God doing something with his hand. Just like the potter takes the clay and he transforms it. And then when, the sh when he shaped it, it's not enough. He needs to bake it. He needs to varnish it. He needs to put uh, gold and silvers or whatever decorations and colors so that at the end this beautiful vase useful for the master's use is put in the place of honor and the, and the house has been uh, started with unshaped, unformed clay and then it has become. So God is doing that. We are his handicraft. God is working now. At the beginning of the chapter it was the spirit of darkness that was at work in us. Now it's like the hands of God are working. It's like, okay, now you're ready. I'm making you ready. I'm perfecting you. So in other words, your conversion, 
your transformation, your salvation, uh, my conversion, it's not the end. You know, sometimes we think, okay, I'm saved. That's it. I've reached out. You know, I'm, I got it. No, this is the beginning. Now I can begin. I'm like the baby just born. Now I can begin to live for God. Before I lived in, in, in darkness and I was aiming at eternal destructions, now I can begin live with meaning, live with something noble. I have now become part of God's new creation. He's working in my life. God continues to work in us to make us what He wants us to be. Now we're just beginning, starting. How do you know the work? How can you do the work that God has prepared for you? In order to know the work that God has prepared for you so that you can walk in them, you need to know God's will. How can you know God's will? You need to come close to the Lord. You need to be near God's heart. If you need near, near God's heart, you will know God's will, you will know the works, and you will work in it. So the key is stay close to Jesus. Stay close to Jesus and let the Word of God be part of your daily life. As soon as this diminish, you know my experience, I've said it before and I will say it again. Anyone that we would look or call a backslider, somebody who had been a Christian and is not a Christian today, first thing, they abandon, neglect progressively the Word of God. That, that is true for every single one of them. Nobody that has been to a good uh, conference, Christian conference, or church service where the anointing is, where they have been reading the Word of God, will decide, I'm leaving God today. This is a progressive walking away from God that you will always find and always well, first thing, one of the first things that will disappear is the interest in and seldom reading of the Word of God to not reading the Word of God and then the reality of the spiritual things disappear. And then the, the world, the material world and all the spirits and all of this awareness disappear and then people will not be Christian anymore. So stay close to Christ Jesus. What kind of good works am I expected to do? There are a description of works here, the two characteristics, good works and prepared by God works. These are the two uh, characteristics. Uh, so why are they called good works? Because again you have to contrast the works that you used to do at the beginning of the chapter while you were under the working of that spirit of darkness. What kind of work can it be? Work of darkness. So if you contrast these works, then, then this is work that are good because now you are under the leading of God. A believer as God working in each one of us. Amen. Let me give you a testimony of, 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 of a lady. She uh, visited a retirement home that was near to her home. And uh, one day when she walked in, she saw a man looking at his food tray, and uh, oh, this old man, and he looked very depressed. And she went to him and says, is there something wrong? Yes, something is wrong. I am a Jew, and I cannot eat this food. I don't like this food. So this lady, she says, uh, uh, what would you like to eat? I'd like to have some soup. So she walked home, she prepared some soup, she come back and she served the soup to him. And then day after day and week after week, she would often go there, ask him what he would like to do, go home, prepare the food and come. So what do you think happened as a result of that? You all know the answer to that. This old man turned to Christ because of the good deeds. The soup and the food have become the good works. And so, so many things can, can be done in this way, preparing soup. You have been saved. Why is it the core message of this chapter? Why is it repeated? Why is it hammered into our face, this truth? Why is it that Paul insists and stresses that, that truth over that? Because Paul wants you and me and every Christian of every generation to have deep in ourselves the fullest assurance of our salvation based on what, how, 
because of who, how we get it, and that we know that we know that we know that we have it. You have been saved. This is an act of the past. The verb tense is in the past. You have been saved, but this action continues and, uh, 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 to be efficient, to be effective, and to uh, our lives uh, today. Uh, someone will say, can, can we really be sure of our salvation? How can someone be sure of their salvation? Yes, we can be sure because the scriptures tell us Jesus in the simplest of ways, John chapter 6, verse 47. For those of you who have done uh, evangelism explosion, you will remember that. Truly, truly, I say unto you, whoever believes in me has, not will, Maybe continue if you add this or that. No. If you believe in me, has eternal life. Can you say that? Has eternal life. But John says it in a different way. Uh, these things have been written so that you may know that you have eternal life, those who believe in Jesus Christ. So you, you, you have, so that you may believe that you have eternal life, that you have received eternal life. So that is a fact that it is clear. Why is it important and essential to have this assurance? Because this is the assurance that true generation has made the church to be the strong and victorious church moving forward, the church that went through tribulations, the church can, can bear uh, all the, the hardships and everything, the, the church that evangelizes, the church that goes to mission, it is because of this assurance of salvation. If you don't have it, you will not dare to do. You know sometime, I, uh, uh, where I live, I have a roof. And sometimes it's very sunny day outside, and I would go and lay clothes on the, the, the roof. And the sun's blind my eyes. And then I come inside, and I need to go down the stairs. I close the door, and then it's dark. I see nothing. And then I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to feel, is that the stairs? I have a, a, the, the ramp here, and I just like, and then the last one before I come into the house, <laughs> is that is that the one? Yes, it is. Okay. So when you don't have assurance of your salvation, <laughs> nothing prospers. You will not do anything. You will not start anything. You will not think of anything. You will not think of being or doing or you don't have it. There's a dot over there. You know. For, for those of you who love sunshines and flowers, here I have a quote for you. In the sunshine of assurance, all Christians' qualities and gifts bloom and flourish. Wow, isn't that beautiful? Wow. In the sunshine of assurance, all Christian qualities and gifts bloom and flourish. If you have the assurance of salvation, you will grow. You will become zealous. And also remember the, you remember this, the exceeding riches of His grace should produce exceeding great works of goodness. Does that make sense? It's like one is a man. Let me finish with the, with the story and the next, the next slide. You will see Mr. Morris. We met him when we went to Sri Lanka the last time. Morris is an amazing man, an amazing testimony, and I think it's a good illustration to finish. This man is the most zealous servant. He, he just lived to please. Uh, to be thoughtful and to do little things for you. That's what he, he sees is calling. He's the leader of a Christian camp in Sri Lanka with a lot of persecutions of Christians, and he just served the Christians. But before he reached that place, he experienced something. Uh, his daughter was born totally handicapped, uh, li like a monster. She had a lump of skin over her, her, her head. Her eyes were not positioned correctly. Her nose was not, her mouth was not. Like she was 
total monster, okay? And uh, that's how she was born. And they cried and cried. They didn't know what to do and everything. And Maurice was an accountant in the company. And uh, they, they spend money, they borrow money, they use money, they look for the best doctors in Sri Lanka. They went to India to, to find better hospital and everything to have an uh, operation. And the best hospital in India, very advanced technology, says we cannot because there's too many uh, connected you know, tissues and nerves and blood and, uh, you know, the, the breathing and the mouth, everything. It's too complicated. We can only deal with more of the external, like the skin, so they remove some of the excess skin that they had and this a little bit, but, and many, many times, many operations, I don't know how, I don't remember the, the numbers of operation, but a big, big, big number of operation. And still, she was still, kind of a monster because the, the main problem was not. So in his job at one point, they needed to grow and they needed to look for, uh, from other countries, uh, people with uh, cement, to, to, like to deal with a huge amount of cement. So finally got in contact with a Canadian man in Alberta, a rich industrial. And then uh, he asked him and the man says, I don't want to go to Sri Lanka. You are a people of terrorists. You are, you are all, all of you are terrorists. I'm not going to go to Sri Lanka. Never. I will never step into this country. So anyway, that's how their relationship started. So after uh, many conversation over the phone, he says, "Okay, Maurice." I will go only for two days, but you need to find me six bodyguards. And I will go there only for two days. You will pick me up at the airport. I will, you know, help you. And then I'm going back to Canada because you are a country of terrorists. Remember years ago that they had the civil war in the Sri Lanka. So, so finally, this man in Canada was a Christian, prayed, and God told him, you go to Sri Lanka. So finally he came for two days, but he stayed for six months. <laughs> And uh, at, the end, at the end of his six months, they had become really close, close friends. Because Maurice is a very special man. So he asked, can I go to your house? You never invited me to your house. But Maurice was kind of shy because, you know, you are rich, I'm, you know, just an ordinary person. My daughter is very handicapped. So he told him, well, I have a very, very handicapped uh, daughter. He says, okay, it's fine. So I want to go and visit your family. So he went there and then he saw the daughter and he, it moved him. So he says, Maurice, I'm going back to Canada. I'm going to find a doctor for your daughter. He did. The doctor contacted Maurice and says, I want to help you, but you need to come to Canada so that I, we will do our own investigation. So they did, and it, people raised funds in Canada. They accepted him, 20, more than 20 families. They live with them. So they went there, then he, they came back to Sri Lanka, and later on they went back for the operation. They made her beautiful enough that she is married today. She's a doctor, and she serves God among the poorest in Sri Lanka. Saying this because that's why Maurice, you cannot make him tired of serving he is so anxious about doing something. What, what can I do to please you? What can I do for you? That's how he lives. And he tells us, God has done for me so much. And he, he uses a lot of superlative. A, a lot of superlative. When he talks about God and what God has done to him, he just cannot believe him. It costs like hundreds of thousands of American dollars for free. And they, 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 they treated this family like they were king and princes and all this. So he's so thankful to God that his mission in life is to serve and to do. So imagine the food we ate when we were there. He was cooking. What would you like? What would you like? I'm so happy. I'm so happy. I'm so happy. That's, that's the, 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 the happiest man I've ever met in life. That's Maurice. So I'm closing with this. Chapter 2 of Ephesians should have the same effect on each one of us. The exceeding riches of God's grace should produce in each one of us an exceeding desire, zeal, to, to give our life for the glory of God. Amen? Amen. That's them. Hallelujah.
Father God, we thank you this 